It's a brand new year. 2024 is here and with it comes optimism, hope, and promising futures for everyone involved. But that doesn't mean we can't start out with a negative and look back on what went horribly wrong in the movie space in 2023. These are movies that are bigger blockbusters. Not a lot of indie stuff on here. Well, there's no indie stuff on here. I'm sticking to the popular kids in school. One of them is actually featured number one on Netflix right now, so that's fun. Let's get started with the list. First off, Happy New Year. Secondly, I do need to bring up a dishonorable mention that kind of skirted by at the end of last year, and that's Avatar 2, The Way of Water. Again, this is not a 2023 release. It was at the tail end of 2022. It was a December release. I had already put my worst of list out, but I got to give it a dishonorable mention. I hated Avatar 2. A lot of critics praised it for the visuals, and I, I don't really know what else, because this is a tech demo at the end of the day. It reuses a lot of the same plot from the first film. The characters make no sense anymore. Jake Sully's a total dipshit who abandons the tribe from the first film that he fought so hard to protect. Now he's just like, eh, we can leave. We can leave and just assume that the, the people invading the planet aren't gonna bomb them into tomorrow for no reason at all. Like, we're gonna secretly leave without them knowing, but yeah, we'll be, they'll be fine. Who cares? I mean, who cares, right? We're, we're leaving, we're dead to them. I just found the whole thing to be a really stupid, shallow attempt at a sequel. Shallow, pun intended, because we're going to be spending a lot of time in the water here. There's some bizarre whale storyline where they're the fountain of youth, even though people can clone themselves a million times over or go into other bodies entirely, such as avatars, which is the entire point of it. Remember, that was the point of the first movie. It's this this thing just was a chore to sit through. It's too freaking long. It doesn't have this massive bump in quality from the first one. I wasn't getting 3D in my eyeballs. I wasn't getting punched in the dick by someone in 4D. No, it was like the first movie again, but without the excitement of the first film because it was so fresh and different with that layered animation. It was just gorgeous. So yeah, tech demo out of the way. What I'm left with is just this stupid, vapid, boring film that I don't want to watch or think about ever again. Subscribe if you hated Avatar 2 as much as I did. All right, let's get to the top 10 worst. In the number 10 spot, Jason Statham's back and he's streaming on Netflix right now in high definition glory with Meg 2, The Trench. And as of recording, it's sitting at numero uno on Netflix in terms of popularity, so... We're doomed. Listen, I get it. I was there day fun at the theater. Giant sharks terrorizing the beaches. Jason Statham looking cool on a jet ski trying to save the day. It just makes sense on paper. Unfortunately, that's the only place it made sense. What little of it it probably did at the time. I hated this film. It was a chore to get through. At almost two hours long, it's way longer than it should be. It's way dumber than it should be. And it's not that fun like it should be. I'm done saying should be, I think. We'll see how it goes for the next several minutes. Statham's back as blank slate character. He now works for Greenpeace as a, I don't know, James Bond-esque operative or something. I'm pretty sure he was filming an Expendables film during this. So they're just like, we'll take the B footage, put it in the Meg, Meg 2, the trench. And really that's the only excitement on land. The rest of this is gonna be out at sea. Uh, very deep down under the sea with, with Little Mermaid and Sebastian and a bunch of other CG creatures. There's a there's an octopus at one point that shows up. That's kind of cool uh, for the 10 seconds it's there. There's some dinosaur things that are swimming around. I don't know what's going on in this movie. It's somehow simultaneously ridiculous and at the same time completely boring and, and generic and stale simultaneously and at the same time are redundant, but this movie's redundant. There is a lot of the same stuff from the first film. Giant sharks in the water, you know, swimming around at nauseum, and then, oh, we're gonna spend the last 10 minutes of the movie with them terrorizing the beaches. Why is that not the priority? Why is that not the main focus? Why are we spending so much time in the deep, dark depths of sea, not being able to see much of anything except for a flare occasionally and some shitty CG Megalodon in the background? I can't believe how sluggish this movie feels. I thought after a very mediocre first attempt 
they would say, okay, we have a fun premise here. It made a ton of money. Let's just go all in. Let's go wild with the mags. Let's have them do these crazy larger than life things. No. Now, to its credit, there are a couple fun shots way late in the game, such as a POV of the teeth closing on some people, and that's about it. The intro where the, the Megalodon somehow takes down a T-Rex in a foot of water, as ridiculous as that was, it at least sets the stage for a very fun, exciting film that we will never see any more of. If they're going to start with that, keep it going, right? They shot the whole load right in the first two minutes. Everything after is just a, a complete letdown. This movie's a complete letdown. The Meg 2, The Trench, somehow way less fun than the first. And I wasn't expecting very much. Insidious the Red Door is the Chex Notes fifth film in the Insidious franchise. <laughs> Who's watching these films? Why are they still getting made? Obviously someone, if there's now five of them. I actually didn't know that going in and really didn't need to. I think I saw the first one and bounced after that. Insidious the Red Door kind of piqued my interest, mainly because it was the first time I'd heard the word Insidious in a decade. So I thought, all right, let's go out and see this. What's happening with the family? What are they up to? Turns out pretty much the same thing they've been up to for four prior movies, which is not a lot. The Darth Maul creature is still terrorizing them. The son's grown up, he's off to college, trying to, you know, make a name for himself as a artist. Really into the coal drawings. He's good at it too, and this film loves showing the coal drawings. They're gonna spend a lot of time on those close-ups of the hands, on the charcoal, hitting the page. It's honestly the most exciting parts of this film. There is very little scaring going on. The budget looks to have been 25 bucks plus a stick of gum. I don't know what happened. I don't know why this was greenlit. Maybe they thought, all right, we have enough brand recognition still with Insidious that we can churn this one out relatively quick, bring back the family for one more ride and get some butts in the seats. I hope it paid off. It's a, it's a bold strategy, Cotton, but it did not work for me at all. Putting it at a college, I thought at the very least, at bare min, short for minimum, we were going to get some fun college campus scenarios where uh, the demons would come out, scare the students, there would be a bunch of fun uh, killings. But there's no death in this movie as far as I can recall. I'd, I don't. I know they don't kill a lot of people in Insidious movies, but by the fifth film, maybe we could up the game a little instead of going back further. It's regressing. And as for the college stuff, it, it, there's nothing. There's one little dorm party, but nothing of substance even happens there. The family seems checked out. Rose Burns in it for maybe 20 seconds. It's just embarrassing. The whole thing is, is a complete wash of a film. It's not scary. It doesn't look good. There's not a single memorable moment in this film. It's a waste of time. Leave the world behind. When this film came out, I put out a review. I titled it Leave This Movie Behind, and I stand by that. What an absolute waste of talent energy and space on the stupid app called Netflix that continues to disappoint with exclusive after exclusive of bad movie or mid movie at best with a rare diamond in the rough. I'm talking one out of 100 movies is great and that's maybe being too generous. Hey, I see you Thunder Force with Melissa McCarthy and Octavia Spencer. I, I didn't forget about you a couple years back. Oof, what a gem that was. Leave the World Behind has some actors in it that used to be cool. Julia Roberts is in the mix. Ethan Hawke's in the, in the flick. His daughter's Maya Hawke. That's how most kids are going to know about this actor at this point. They're uh, phoning it in. Serviceable performances. You know what? I take that back. Julia Roberts, almost an embarrassing performance, especially when she's shouting at CG animals, woodland critters uh, right next to the house. There are so many stupid scenes in this movie that just make me take pause and scratch my head. Basic premise, a family out in the woods at an Airbnb that for some reason this multi-millionaire guy is renting out, even though it's his primary house still. The whole thing is just a little bizarre from a premise point of view. He comes back because there's a shenanigans going on in town. He needs a place to stay, doesn't want to go to an apartment, who cares? He's got a racist daughter. Julia Roberts is racist back. Everybody's racist and 
they're they're uh, ignorant and they're stupid and it's all social commentary about the world and how we all live too much online and we're quick to label each other and we're quick to make snap judgments and not really go inward at all. There's a lot of commentary here. They even played Jenga at one point and the Jenga tower is about to fall over, which definitely symbolism, you know, it's it's ripe with it. And the comments when I made this review were very quick to tell me, Adam, you are stupid and you didn't understand the movie and it's deep, profound complexities. They're all over the place, Adam. You didn't get it. You didn't get the message. It's the same thing I heard when The Sound of Freedom came out last year. You didn't get the message, Adam, or it's all about the message, Adam. Who cares if the movie might not be that great? It is great because of what it's telling people to wake up. Wake up, world. Uh, yeah, I think most people are awake. We just feel helpless or powerless when in, for instance, The Sound of Freedom, uh, kids are getting smuggled and they're being trafficked. It's terrible. Everybody knows this is happening. What do you want us to do about it? It's the same thing with sweatshops going on all over the country. There's more slavery today than there was 50 years ago, and that's not a lie. We are so comfortably numb to everything, and you feel powerless. So when a movie like Leave the World Behind comes out, it says, you know, we're all slaves to the machine, we're all cogs, and, and we need to wake up, and there could be an attack from foreign soil. America is not this superpower. We don't have a deep state. We're not that deep, bro. They could take over our satellites. They could put something into the air, like an anthrax or a different chemical, and we should be listening to nature. We should be listening to the creatures who are trying to warn us. It's all there. The problem is it's boring as fuck. It's not exciting. And once you see one of these moments where something's going after them, whether it's a giant ship crashing into the beach, or uh, it's a bunch of cars, a bunch of smart cars getting smashed together, it's the same thing over and over. Look out, we gotta get out of the way. We're in front of a green screen. Oh, we made it. I don't care about any of these characters. I hate them all. It's one thing to watch a movie like Day After Tomorrow, which is schlocky and stupid, or Independence Day, or Twister, or... Like, I like all those movies for different reasons, but the one thing they have in common is they have likable lead characters, even if they're one-dimensional, and they have a story with the beginning, middle, and end. The one thing that um, Leave the World Behind failed to do. It's got the beginning. I don't really think it has a middle or an end. And this whole Friends bullshit cop-out with the daughter wanting to watch Friends and then finding a place to go. Oh, great. Can I fill in the blanks, please, for, for a movie that you never really even gave me the main threat or any real obstacles to overcome? I would love to do that. Let me use my imagination be the writer. What a wonderful experience. Said no one ever. This movie's up its own ass with commentary, and it's just it just forgot to be an engaging movie. And it's the worst kind of movie because... It, it puts the carrot out there. And it's like, oh, we're going to go somewhere with this. We're going to go somewhere with this. We're going to go some. Nope, we're not actually. Got you. Two and a half hours later, you played yourself. You played yourself. In the number seven spot, Heart of Stone, which I think is a very apt title because this movie really feels like stone. It has no value. It's just there. It is a rock. There's no emotional core to it. There's no real interesting set pieces to it. It feels like it was built by a machine, taking the plot of the recent Mission Impossible movie, taking some of the characters from other iconic films, and then just kind of blending it together with a lead protagonist so dull. You almost wonder if they had to give Gal Gadot reverse acting lessons, if they took her to a place to suck all the soul and energy out of her. Because I've seen her in other movies far better than this. They kind of tried to uglify her, if that's even possible. It's not. But they tried to, you know, tone her down a bit and give her more of an agent feel, like a, a computer nerd agent. None of it lands. And then to make matters worse, she's a double agent. She's supposed to be this super sexy, slick spy pretending to be a nerdy bookworm agent. And early on, it's just clear that there's no stakes at all. When she flies down this mountain and disposes of like 12 dudes without leaving a single footprint in the snow, she somehow got rid of all the bodies. Meanwhile, the rest of her team is coming down the lift. They can see all of this, yet don't. It's just ridiculous. The whole thing's ridiculous. 
It's set on a sound stage for the most part. Nothing feels tangible or real or physically there. It's just Gal Gadot jumping off of fake shit in front of other fake shit and it's not believable in the slightest. And I really don't get the point because from a spectacle standpoint, sure, one or two of the sequences, fine. But again, this movie is so long and without any real connection to the character or really knowing what the driving force behind the movie is, I, I just don't see a point. And without charisma, like I've seen plenty of Arnold Schwarzenegger movies, the guy's got charisma coming out of his ears. And so he can carry a movie with kind of a dumb plot just by his presence. But when you take Gal Gadot and you strip away the charms that she does have and the sex appeal she does have, you're left with just nothing. You're left with a heart of stone. We got there. Ant-Man and the Wasp, Quantum Shidia, the third entry to the Ant-Man film, the 9,000th entry to the MCU at this point. I've lost track and I don't even care to count. And I would guess, I would go out on a limb and say that 90% of the people out there don't give a shit about the MCU anymore. I pulled that number out of my ass, of course. But I do feel based on, you know, just circumstantial evidence and online evidence and just kind of, you know, the, the whispers and the talking going on, that no one really has that much interest in the MCU. After Endgame, we had a couple cherries on top of the Sunday. Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3 being fantastic. Spider-Man No Way Home being solid. Some people love that movie, that's fine. So there's some winners. But outside of that, we have a whole lot of losers. Eternals, Thor, Love and Thunder, Snore, Love and Dunder, Boar, Love and Down Under. <laughs> Just a lot of train wrecks. And Ant-Man and the Wasp, Quantum Shidia, really kind of solidified my feelings. It packaged it all together. A culmination of everything fans and even just random moviegoers alike have started to notice. This train's left the station. Any sort of soul that was put into these, any sort of heart or care, completely gone. We said for a long time, I've said it, these movies feel like conveyor belt manufactured products. They don't feel like films, they feel like products, like a McDonald's Happy Meal toy. And for a while, the MCU was able to get away with that, rest on it, because it was still fresh. You know, when Iron Man 2 came out, it was still different enough, even though I thought that movie sucked, that you wanted to see where this whole experiment was gonna go. And we liked these characters enough to go on for the journey for better and for worse. But after they killed off pretty much all the main ones, what we're left with is the C-Team, Ant-Man, Captain Marvel, She-Hulk, Moon Knight. Who are these people? I asked about half of them. And the other half, I just didn't care that much. Ant-Man already saved the galaxy, whatever, a few times over. So here we are again with Ant-Man and the Wasp, Quantum Shidia, and now suddenly this isn't like a C-list character. Now we're, we're pretending this is a triple A star and he's gonna introduce the new big bad, Kang the Conqueror. Hell no, it doesn't fit in this world that we've established. And putting Ant-Man and his dumbass daughter Cassie or Casey, I always forget how to say it. I'm going to go with Cassie. Putting them into the quantum realm for 99% of the picture, terrible idea. Because what we have is some of the laziest green screen work I've ever seen in a giant multi-million dollar film like this. I'm sorry, multi-hundreds of millions of dollars of film. And I just, nothing seemed like it mattered. Casey's laughing through most of her dialogue, even when it's supposed to be serious. Nothing feels serious. Kane gets beat up by some fucking ants. This is supposed to be the new big bad. There's a point in the movie where I thought, and it was already way past the, uh, the point where I was going to care much, but there was a point where I thought, all right, they're going to do something here. They're going to get a little ballsy and they're going to kill off Paul Rudd's character. Because... Uh, Cassie, Casey Jones, whatever it is, she somehow built this quantum thing with her grandpa and mostly her, I believe, experimenting with it, going in and out of this realm. Just, you know, she's like 12, so of course she can. She gets them out and, and dad's like, I gotta stay back. I gotta stay back. Lang's gotta fight Kang or Kong or uh, Captain Crunch and then I'll come back with you. But then the portal seals up and we're like, oh shit, he's sacrificing himself. He's going to stay behind. And not even two minutes go by, not even 20 seconds go by. And oh, just joking, they pull him back into the real world as well. 
useless. They didn't even give us enough time to maybe be worried about him getting killed, let alone the fact that most probably didn't care. I was actually hoping, because then I would have had some sort of feeling during this film. This was the final nail in the coffin for me where I said, yep, I really don't care at all about what happens anymore with the MCU. Maybe they'll surprise me and throw out a good movie once in a while, but as a whole, it's over. I was watching Dune the other night and I just thought to myself, you know what, Rebel Moon kind of was like this, wasn't it? Like a, like a school project version of Dune. And I don't think the new Dune is the most amazing movie ever, but I do think from a visual standpoint, from a directorial standpoint, it's damn impressive. Even if it is slow and long, it's got massive scale. It's got some insane set pieces. The action's top notch. And then I look at Netflix's Zack Snyder Presents Rebel Moon Part 1, Child of Dumbass, who cares? This thing is dog water bad. I couldn't believe how garbage it looked from Zack Snyder, a guy that's known for having really good cinematography. It just feels all so light now and lame now and small, even when he's using the vastness of space. And this is his Star Wars, his grandiose picture, his two-part production or three-part or whatever he makes it. And yet it still feels like the small soundstage production. It's just sad at this point. This guy has not really grown as a director. I think he's actually regressed. He's gone backwards into his shell, into this echo chamber of fans that he's created that just love everything he puts out. And they're like, Zack Snyder's the blueprint. He made a shot from around someone's shoulder and another movie did that. He's the blueprint. No, nah, no, nah, I think he's kind of just uh, at this point a hack who's taking ideas from other directors who are more competent in the space and he's trying to make them his own. This movie reeks of Star Wars and it really reeks of a lot of other movies I've seen in the sci-fi space. And I just think to myself, what, is this a bug's life? What? I mean, the plot's essentially the bug's life where it's a small little shit town village planet that for some reason is still using old school horse and, and, and buggy and, and like pulling <laughs> Some some woman's plowing the field <laughs> while there's spaceships like and then she's like gotta get that dusty trail again. It's ridiculous. But even putting that aside is the premise where this giant evil empire comes down with their ships and they're gonna take all of their stuff. Like we want you to grow crops for our men for the next several months, and then we're gonna come back and take it all. Okay, why? Really? Really? And now I'm expecting this ragtag crew to rise up and fight and face them and fight them. And so the main protagonist, who's the sad sack, miserable woman to watch, she goes and recruits for the majority of this picture. 80% of this movie is just her going on recruiting people. And they suck as much as she does. It's just terrible to watch. It doesn't look great. And when it does look great, Zack Snyder goes all in on slow motion like it's a Bollywood film, but done in the worst way possible because at least when Tollywood and Bollywood and Indian movies do it, they usually slow-mo when something cool's going on. Snyder is now slow-moing when someone's tying their shoe. Snyder's slow-moing when someone's sneezing. <laughs> It's, it's bad. And it ends on possibly the worst cliffhanger I've ever seen. Think Star Wars episode, what are we, what is it, three? The one everybody loves, Revenge of the Sith? I think most would still agree that that final shot where Darth Vader goes, no, is, is about as cringe as it could possibly get. They up it here. Snyder says, I love that no scene. I'm going to do it with my blank slate character who has nothing really exciting about him. If people dressed up as him for Halloween, it's basically just how I look. Like, hi, I'm, I'm just boring, generic dude. Trick or treat. I'm from Rebel Moon. No, screw this movie. Bird Box 2. Box of Bullshit, or it's actually called Barcelona, but you could have fooled me. I think my title's more appropriate. This is a film that I don't think anyone asked for. It just came out unceremoniously, shat onto Netflix like most of their properties are. It might have, to date, the most unlikable lead character I've ever watched. And I'm not even trying to be like over the top or extreme with it. I hated this lead character. 
He constantly screws people over and he's selfish. And yes, it's later revealed that he's brainwashed by this evil alien entity that's killing everyone when they open their eyes. But some people, they're actually brainwashing or taking over or doing something. It's just not exciting or interesting to watch. It actually is frustrating as all hell. Because you're watching this person just constantly terrorize people and ruin people's lives and get people killed for selfish reasons. And when it's revealed that, oh, he's under the spell of this creature, okay, that doesn't make anything more fun to watch or, or even more interesting to watch. It just makes me hate him all the more. And the final act is so cheaply produced with really bad CG fire effects. And the whole production feels like a budget version of the first with Sandra Bullock. And that movie I thought was perfectly fine. Didn't love that. But for a Netflix movie, it was like, eh, all right. And a side note, I love that there's now an excuse people have baked in with Netflix movies. When I was shitting all over Rebel Moon, people go... Adam, it's a Netflix movie. Like, you need to understand that. Oh, okay. What, what does that even fucking mean? Netflix and these other streaming services are the new movies now. They're running the big guys out of business. Or they're making them change their model. Disney's starting to lose money. Mainly because they shot themselves in the dick by releasing a bunch of stuff on Disney+. Plus, Devaluing their own properties. Fox doesn't even exist anymore. Disney owns them. Warner Brothers might get bought out by freaking, what, Universal or Paramount or something. Like, everybody's... There's going to be, like, three companies pretty soon. Amazon owns MGM, I think. Amazon's going to own a bunch of stuff. Netflix will own a bunch of stuff. Apple will own a bunch of stuff. And that's it. These are movies now. So to say, oh, it's a Netflix movie. What did you expect? I expected something good. Because there's so much crap out there, why waste the one time we have on Earth watching shit? So my job, at least this is the job I've, I've given myself for some reason, is to watch these movies and say, hey, this is worth your time. Because there's 50 new movies that come out every day now. Maybe check this one out. Or this is a big blockbuster that you are going to enjoy probably or tread lightly i liked it you didn't there's a lot of indie stuff that comes out too some of it's really good but uh, i've always been a sucker for the big spielberg films for the big um james cameron movies for christopher nolan for Zack snyder believe it or not back in the day and so yeah i'm still trying to hang on you know when a big blockbuster comes out or a, a large theater release and then i give you my thoughts and sometimes we get a worst of list and and yeah bird box box of bullshits on there strays is one of those comedies that you either love or you hate i think i don't i don't know if there's much of a middle ground it reminded me of sausage party it's pretty much a one note joke from beginning to end oh food is swearing and making sexual comments constantly and they're doing sexual acts isn't that crazy and different because it's food in strays case it's Oh, animals are swearing constantly and doing sexual things to each other and performing crazy acts. Isn't that wild because it's animals? It's the same exact thing. Very sophomoric humor, which I can definitely appreciate from time to time. But it's just too much. It's just swearing every other sentence for shock value and, and that loses its luster. I couldn't even finish this movie in all... Like, real practicality, this should really be number one on my list because I couldn't get through it. I shut. It's the only movie on this list that I actually shut off. To be fair, it's one of the movies that I didn't go to theaters to see. I saw it on Peacock or something. I checked it out on the cock. I didn't pay money to see it in theaters. I have yet in my lifetime... Oh, wait, I did once during Biker Boys. Oh, wait, I'm sorry, I did it twice. I've walked out of two movies in my lifetime. One was Biker Boys with a Z... And another one was House of the Dead by U Bowl or U A Bowl, whatever the hell it is. I I was in college at the time, so I had to get to class, and I just didn't care enough. I I hated these movies so much that I'd rather go sit in a boring class than actually finish the film, and that says a lot about me. It says a lot about the film too. Strays just I, I made it thirty minutes in. Not my cup of tea. I found it to be incredibly juvenile and just really stupid all around. I will say some of the cinematography, the way the animals were done is pretty impressive. If I'm going to throw a compliment out there for no real reason. Outside of that, nothing here worked. Winnie the Pooh. Blood and Honey. 
I mean, the name says it all, doesn't it? What, what we're gonna get here is a real magical experience. When Winnie the Pooh went into public domain, one small little film shop licked their lips and said, you know what, we can do something really special with this. We can take this in a different direction. And you know what, the thought process isn't bad. I kind of like the idea of imaginations running wild, the little South Park riff idea, Christopher Robbins in dire straits, he's back in the woods and his friends are, are not what they seem. The problem is they didn't take it very far. Clearly this had no budget. Winnie the Pooh looks terrible. The masks on these creatures are awful. Piglet doesn't even look like Piglet. He's got tusks for some reason. They only had enough for one of the masks, I guess. Eeyore's just a tail. They couldn't get the rights, I guess, to Tigger or they just didn't bother. Well, oh bother, right? Oh bother. Christopher Robin's in it for a little while. The kills are really lame. The cinematography is atrocious. The lighting is all over the place. It was clearly shot on different days, maybe different weeks or months. The whole thing was probably done though over the course of four months, I feel like, or less. It just seems rushed as hell. The script is half-baked. There's no real references to the Disney show at all because they don't have the rights to those characters. It's just, it, there's, there's nothing to hear. It just feels so stock. Like, this could have been anything, and they threw Winnie the Pooh in last second sort of a deal. What a waste of time. Naturally, they're going to get a sequel out of this crap, and uh, it'll probably do very well because it's already pr it's already done, and they have a trailer. A year later, they already finished the second movie. So that's going to tell you everything you need to know. They're trying to speed this along to stay on the hype train. And again, these things cost so little that they're going to see some revenue. And we're going to never see the end of these garbage movies, unfortunately. Great title, though. Film sucks. I'm not an Expendables guy. <laughs> I've seen all of them. And I really like Sly Stallone. Sylvester Stallone's great. Love seeing Arnold in these. It was great seeing Bruce Willis show up. Chuck Norris was fun. Antonio Banderas, Jet Li. A lot of cool actors. Dolph Lundgren's in the mix. Mel Gibson was a bad guy. Jean-Claude Van Damme. A lot of fun 80s, 90s callbacks. Really schlocky action. But man, what a sad, embarrassing fall from grace to go to some of these legends over to Megan Fox is now one of the main protagonists. Sly Stallone's in his own movie series for maybe 10 minutes now. They fake kill him off. It's the most obvious fake out death in existence. This movie is so poorly done from top to bottom. The jokes don't land. It has this really awful plot where they kill essentially an innocent dude. They fake the death of Stallone by replacing his body with an innocent guy that he got in a little tiff with. But there's no reason to strap him to a plane still alive and blow him up. Are you out of your mind with this? Outside of a bizarre premise, this movie clearly had little budget and they spent most of it on this ship, a container ship where a lot of the action is going to take place. I'd say the majority of the actions here, it's all backloaded. And it ranges from some noticeably good choreographed fights to just the usual shtick, shooting around. Dolph Lundgren has just a terrible character arc where he can't see because he's getting older and he, he has to drink so he can shoot straight again. Just so dumb. Uh, again, Stallone's barely in this thing. Statham looks just completely checked out. He's just cashing a check. He's doing 18 different movies right now. Meg's right around the corner. He's got that stupid beekeeper movie he's probably filming for. The guy's just cashing checks left and right. Andy Garcia's the villain of this. <laughs> That's who they went with from Mel Gibson in the last one. Andy Garcia. What are we even doing anymore? The, the thing was just such a sad way to end The Expendables. Again, a film franchise that was not by any means peak. This wasn't the, the, the dark night of movies, right? This is just some really schlocky, low-budget effort, action, and humor. But in this instance, you have nothing left. We're at 50 Cent now. That's where we've landed. Megan Fox and 50 Cent. It's just sad. And speaking of sad, there you have it. 10 terrible movies that came out in 2023. I, I didn't see everything that came out, believe it or not. Netflix easily could have owned this entire top 10 list had I wasted my time watching a lot of the garbage they put out. The same could be said for Hulu or Peacock or Amazon Prime or Apple Plus or Disney Plus or Plus 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 Plus. They all have a bunch of shovelware. These are these 
top shelf movie rental movies that are now just shat out onto streaming services because movie rental stores don't exist anymore. And we got to find ways to write taxes off. We got to get those tax right off somehow. So we make some 14th Anaconda movie and we slip it right out the back door. This is a list of movies that I saw almost all in theaters outside of one or two that were kind of bigger releases for streaming platforms. Of course, this is just my opinion. You are free to like any of these films and I won't judge you for it. I like a lot of bad movies myself and that's okay. We can have arguments. We can have debates. Let me know though. Did you see these movies? Do you hate them? Did you think they were terrible? Or did you think, Adam, you're, you're way off. Uh, Zack Snyder is the playbook. Rebel Moon is the film of the year. Let me know. Like the video if you had a good time. Please think about subscribing as I post tons of content each and every week. Would love to have you stick around. All right. Once again, Happy New Year. Take care.